Let's try that again. Hey, Nico. <laughs> I didn't hear you say that. Hi, Alex. How's it going? How's it going? <laughs> Did you say that and you were just waiting for me to respond and I hadn't heard you, so I was just sitting here? No, it was uh, totally me. I forgot to unmute myself. So welcome to our first live YouTube broadcast. We tried. Uh, <laughs> off to a great start. <laughs> Let's do it again. Um, you know, I don't think we should. I think that will just muck things up. So, um, Let's get going. I'm, I'm ready to plow ahead. This is Terra Incognito. Yeah. It's so exciting. I'm delighted to be here with all of the warts and whiskers. Yes. And uh, you've got some cool posters behind you, which is good timing because we're, I mean, good timing. It's your freaking office. Um, I'm broadcasting live from beautiful Union City, New Jersey. And uh, we're here to talk about vintage posters and the results of your February 18th sale. Um, I, I'm i just wondering, you know, you're the auctioneer for that sale, obviously. Uh, just in the broad sense, if you got like a any particular sense of the market um, as it stands from that auction. I, I mean, that's a pretty big ask to get a sense of the market from one sale, but I will say that uh, at 77% sell-through rate, it was one of our most, if not the most robust regular season poster sale that we've had since we started keeping records about 15, 20 years ago. 77% is a, sort of like an industry leading level of sell-through rate. Um, you know, was it higher because we did a better job and put better material in the auction? Maybe. Was it higher because so many people around the world are trapped at home with nothing to do and the idea of posters was a beautiful diversion? Maybe. Um, but my sense from the podium and my sense from looking at the results of the sale was that it really did surprisingly well. And I, I say surprising because of the times that are happening around us. One would not necessarily equate a pandemic with a robust auction market, but uh, the facts seem to belie that. Uh, that's certainly what we've been seeing across categories at SWAN. Um, we were doing this broadcast a day after our most recent auction, which was uh, fine books and autographs. and we saw kind of a similar pattern. So we're, we're really here today to talk about your top lots and just some of the things that perform particularly well. Um, should we share some images? Yeah, let's share some images. Let's jump right in. So this is uh, this was your top lot of the auction. Emmanuel Orazi, La Maison Moderne, just an extraordinary uh, poster of Art Nouveau, uh, Fond de Siec, Paris. Uh, advertising a store that featured the Art Nouveau lifestyle. All of those knickknacks and bibelots and tchotchkes on the shelf behind this beautiful woman were fine artworks that were available at the store, as was the armchair she's sitting in, designed by Henry Vandervelde. Um, so it's sort of like a, a visual catalog and a visual tour de force of all the top-notch Art Nouveau designs and designers that were kicking around Paris at the turn of the century. It's it's like really, really gorgeous. And it can you give us a sense of scale? Because that's hard to get from this this image. Is it's it this big? This big. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's about, I believe, four and a half, four, four and a half feet wide and, and three feet tall. I mean, it really is an impressive piece of graphic real estate for a wall, for example. And I think the very simple color scheme is startling too, that takes the large size and just makes it all the more eye-catching with the bright colors. Do you think it, it like? Do you think that a poster like this is particularly collectible today because of like aesthetic sensibilities? Is this something that resonates with a collector today? That's really interesting. I don't know that this is the kind of piece that would be bought by a new collector, like a collector of today. I think it's the kind of piece that really resonates through more uh, mature collecting markets, both because of the era, because of the artist, because of the image. Uh, and because of its rarity. I mean, I think this was a single store that was advertising its wares as opposed to like uh, a giant Parisian department store that would have printed many, many more copies of the poster. Uh, I don't see this as like an entryway item for, for a, a current collector. I think it's something, uh, it's not an impulse purchase uh, at the price it sold for. I think it's really something that somebody has been searching for for a long time. High level Art Nouveau. High level um, Art Nouveau, very sophisticated. I mean, it's a museum piece. Uh, yeah. In many ways. 
and it sold for thirty-seven thousand five hundred. Uh, it was the top lot of the sale. It did, you know, great. And uh, in doing a little research, the last time we had the poster was in two thousand and seven, so fourteen years ago, and it sold for half the price. It sold for eighteen thousand dollars. So you wow. know, doubling, doubling in a decade and a half. I think that's really sort of an indication of the market in general, and and a very positive thing that we can all sort of look at and uh, find find some joy in. Um, while we're talking about Art Nouveau, I think it's worthwhile to, to look at this piece. And this is like, when I was looking through the catalog for the sale, I was like, why is there an Alphonse Mucha original in the poster sale? Yeah, more importantly than that, <laughs> I'm surprised that that would be the, the first thing that pops into your mind. I look at this and the first thing that I see is that it really doesn't look like a traditional Alphonse Mucha very much, whose style is so very particular and so very um, floral and decorative. Oh, that's uh, interesting. But this is an original Mucha sketch. Um, we sell original art by poster artists as well as the posters that those artists designed uh, together. Uh, this is a sketch for a New Year's greeting. You see sort of um, 1890 very lightly there in the background. I don't know if it was ever realized. I don't know what it was ever uh, used for, if anything. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, it was very hotly contested over, or very, very hotly, uh, very competitively fought over. Uh, I think the original estimate was a fraction of the final price. And it, it just goes to show that some of these great artists, their original works are, their original sketches even, not their completed works, are, are eminently desirable in and of themselves. Um, if we continue along the Art Nouveau lines, this is from uh, Le Stomp Modern. It's another image by Mucha, uh, but it should be pointed out that it's from a series called Le Stomp Modern, which was a hundred different prints uh, printed between 1897 and 1899. We just chose to illustrate the Mucha here. Um, and each one, it was, uh, it's 24 fascicles. Uh, each with four prints in them and then a couple of additional prints making a total of a hundred. Can you define um, fascicles for the people, the folks watching at home? Yeah, fascicle is a great word. It's not it's a great a word. word. And it's not uh, facile, but a fascicle is like an issue. A fascicle is like okay. a little separate issue that comes bound in its own um, cover. And each one of these 24 covers was designed by Alphonse Mucha as well. Is the, it, the fascicle, the ickle is like, it, it's a diminu diminutive, like, as opposed that, to a fascic, which is a big fascic. Yeah, well, I'm like, I'm wondering. <laughs> just... You know, I didn't actually study the derivation of the word. I didn't think fascicle was a diminutive form. I thought it was, it's like um, I will word. admit, I'm not so good with the French, so it's entirely possible. I'm... Great word, though, fascicle. We could do an entire uh, broadcast on the history of fascicles. Um, but the point is that that this, this very robust price for this... Um, set of 100 images uh, was really one of, one of the other great highlights of the sale. And then we come to the Grand Prix and this absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous image. Um, I, I'm tempted to uh, try to zoom in here, but I'm not going to. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a, there's a little owl in the tree up here um, wide open at all of the excitement happening beneath him. You know, one of the things I really love about this poster being in the in the top lots of the sale is it shows that um, the top lots ranged across a gamut of different genres. And one of the things about our regular winter poster auction is that it covers a lot of different ground. Art Nouveau, Art Deco, travel, food and drink, uh, exhibition posters, automotive posters in this case, bicycle posters, we had a number of those as well. Uh, this one clearly in the automotive category, just a just a powerful image from the very early days of um, Grand Prix racing. Um, and this was I uh, I remember in your from your post sale notes. This was a world record for the artist. Both for the poster and the artist. This poster has come up for sale maybe three or four other times in the past twenty years, and and this was the highest record ever for this poster and. For all of the research that I was able to do, the highest price for any piece ever designed by this artist that's come up for sale, Vladimir. And do you know anything about the artist beyond 
Um, the, um, his first two initials are H A. No, <laughs> not, not a lot. That that would account for most of it. <laughs> I, you know, I always feel bad putting poster specialists on the spot about that because I feel like there are a lot of these uh, graphic designers from back in the day that kind of they were they were notable, but they their like biographies are not super fleshed out. Um. You don't feel too badly about it. That's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind saying that there's often cases, fairly frequently cases, where artists just have scant to no biographical information available. We do the best we can, um, but we are limited by you know what knowledge is available to the rest of the world. Bringing us to Zermatt. Speaking um, of the world and, and and going back to my point that, that some of the highlights of the sale were, were scattered across many different categories uh this being part of the ski and winter resort ski and winter resort poster section uh we've been selling ski posters uh for must be upwards of 20 years now and uh, it was quite a uh quite a showing this time around uh we sold 92% of the ski posters we offered. We offered about 50 of them. We sold 92%, which I'm fairly certain is a company record. Um, again, I suppose I attribute this to the fact that people are all penned up at home and not being allowed to go skiing this winter because of the pandemic. So they're finding solace in the acquiring or collecting of ski posters. That's as good a theory as any. Um, but this one just, this, it's an early image, 1908. It is such a fantastically clear and realistic image, which we don't make much of now, but in 1908, it was as close to um, earth shattering as, as possible in the graphic design world. I'm actually gonna remove the title card here so that you don't get that interference because it is super gorgeous. Um, have you ever been to Zermatt? You know, I have. Um, I was far too young to appreciate it. Um, me too. <laughs> I might have been on a drunken ski trip as well, so I might not have been in any state to appreciate it either, but I, I did enjoy it, uh, the town and the skiing. What I, what I love about this piece uh, especially is that it's singularly unclear if this is sunrise or sunset. Um, and it, it, it works either way, clearly, and I don't think it matters. I think the mountain is so majestic and so beautiful and rendered so perfectly uh, with such uh, captivating colors by Cardinot that it doesn't matter. And the point may just be any time of the day or night, this mountain is just one superb um, natural wonder. This is a example of a travel poster too. Like in addition to being a ski poster, it's a travel poster. You know, right? Ski posters by their very nature are travel yeah. posters because they're advertising travel to ski areas. And it does it does the trick. I'm like, I want to be there, and you it really evokes the place of Zermatt, where you are on the mountain, basically, and it is so big. It's like it's it's. I mean, it's you know the Matterhorn, um, but it's like it's looming so large when you're in town. Um, it's and so this big. It's almost like a mountain, isn't it? What almost like a mountain? You know, I don't in New York a mountain is at least a three hour drive away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then speaking of uh, actually a three hour drive from New York to uh, Lake Placid, perhaps. Yeah, up to Lake Placid. This, uh, for some reason, and I, I tried to figure it out, but I can't really figure out, this is really one of my favorite American ski posters. Uh, it's by Sasha Maurer, who is one of the great American ski poster artists. Um, Lake Placid had uh, become world renowned after the Olympics were held there. I believe it was 1932. Uh, and this poster probably, I haven't been able to prove it definitively, but probably is the very first iteration of um, this kind of typography through ski tracks, which have appeared on posters throughout the decades subsequently, but I haven't been able to find one before this. Such a simple idea and such a clever idea. They're literally skiing out the word ski. Um, and uh, very sweet. it's very sweet. It's sweet. It's clever. It's fun. It's captivating. Everything about it. Um, you know, the angle of the of the uh, title at Lake Placid compared with the angle of the skis. I mean, it's a very dynamic image, too. And um, Maurer just does a great job. And I'm very happy to say that we achieved a world record price for the poster 
uh, during the sale, which I think is well deserved. And I will point out uh, with a small bit of pride that the world record that we broke was a record that we set in 2004 here at Swan as well. Um, so we really sort of have a, a, a very strong market for American ski posters, which is, is great because it's such an important niche part of the market. Um, if, we, if we move on from skiing to uh, the sublime, uh, although I suppose it's not alcohol. It's not alcohol, it's actually mineral water. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we had a nice section in the auction of food and beverage posters, including a great run of posters uh, for Guinness, um, which I just adored. The best part about it was writing a blog post on Guinness posters, which I did while drinking a four pack of Guinness, um, something that I'm not likely to forget for a long time, nor remember in its entirety either. <laughs> and this poster I, I'm including here in the show because it's not a rare poster, and it's a poster we've had before. It's actually the top of a two-sheet poster, uh, and the, the, the bottom sheet would have just had type on it, uh, advertising. I think it would have actually had the extension of the bottle, and then it would have been advertising uh, Source Fair DA uh, and, the, and the qualities of the mineral water. But a lot of people remove that bottom sheet because it's superfluous to the image, uh, and it's sold just like this. Uh, like I said, it's not a rare poster, but it's a wonderful poster. And this was, to the best of my knowledge, a world record price for the image, um, which I just thought it was interesting that not only are we selling rare and seldom seen posters at world record prices, we're selling um, some really classic, wonderful images also very, very strongly. And and it's, yeah, I mean, it's such a, it, it feels like one of those images that you can picture reproduced on people's walls and, um, of course, original posters have a very different dimension to them than the reproductions you'd see in a chain restaurant somewhere. Yeah, again, this um, one is pretty large. This is probably going to be four or five feet wide by three and a half, four feet high. So again, it just takes up a great position on the wall and has very makes a very bold impression when you see it. Yeah, that's a lot of wall, wall power for wall those power. bubbles. <laughs> and then our, I think our last image here is a national parks poster so this is the exact same thing again this is a travel poster again we did great with the travel posters in the sale we have a separate auction every year of rare and important travel posters which is one of my favorites because i'm an inveterate traveler and i love posters and it's bringing two of my favorite things together in one spot this poster again not a rare poster but a great poster and one once more we hit a world record price for this i uh, put that on the screen there oh, yeah yep Oop. There I got it. There there it is. Is. Here to stay. Um, <laughs> and I, it just, just made me really happy that, uh, you know, things things that uh, people really covet, they're spending a lot of money on. And I think that's what shows the heart of the poster market is that items are really beginning to be coveted by collectors or perhaps by armchair travelers. I, I don't know who bought this piece. I don't know what their rationale was, but I have to imagine that they love the West or perhaps they have a home somewhere near Zion Park in, in Utah. Um, but uh, it's you can just see from the colors, it's a great image and um, it, it just did really well, as did the sale as a whole. Well, thank you for that recap. You're welcome, this was great. Um, you know, we got off to a little bit of a rocky start, but it, it just was smooth sailing uh, afterwards. Yeah, well, you know, uh, once you figure out your audio, the the rest of the video tends to fall fall together. And you know, it would it would be it would be small of me to say that you made very clear to tell me to make sure I turned my mute button off. <laughs> um, and I was like, I'll do it. I'll make sure I do it. And then what happened was you left your mute button on. So I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you just you you get something in your head and you want to make sure that your toddler isn't screaming in the background yeah, of the I video. Got, and, you know, you've done tremendous work uh, putting this whole streamyard things to, together. So you did have a lot on your plate. Thank you for for uh, that a little bit. Nico, uh, when is your next sale? Of so the next sale is coming up in May. I believe the date is May thirteenth. 13th or 14th. It's around the middle of May. Middle of May. Uh, a wonderful <laughs> option of graphic design. Uh, we actually have some things coming in. I kid you not. And I know I am prone to hyperbole and I tend toward the bombast. No, but I kid no. you not. We had some things 
come in and and Lauren Goldberg and I, Lauren, who is the poster specialist here at Swan, we work together. I said to Lauren, this actually makes me cry. It's so good. Oh. Cry in a good way. Cry in a good way. I mean, it was really just, it's amazing what we have. It's going to be posters. It's going to be magazines. It'll be book jacket design. Um, wow. It's going to be, it's going to be killer. So can please. you, uh, I want to also just mention that you do a uh, regular broadcasts by Instagram. Your, uh, Instagram handle is at Nico Lowry. I believe it's very easy to find. And you can also follow Swan at Swan Galleries, um, for, for to the moment updates on the things that make us cry, uh, as auctioneers. Cry, um, listen, crying with glee over a collectible is just the fine. I, I, I would wish feeling. anybody. It's just wonderful. It's like eating a great meal and drinking a great wine and just being like, <laughs> wow, I, I am in the right place. I'm doing what I love to do mm -hmm. the thing I love to be with and nothing is any better. All right. Well, thanks for recapping the highlights of our, uh, your auction with me and I will see you soon. All right, Alex. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.